John, could you give us a potted history of Edge Hill University from its origins to where we are today? Certainly, Peter. Been around a long time, first and foremost. And it was actually founded in 1885 in Liverpool uh, by seven of the city's philanthropists, you know, the Rathbones, the Holtz and the like, and founded alongside the University of Liverpool. The reason it was founded, actually, was to provide educational opportunities for women of the city. And the colours of the university, right the way back from the 1880s right to today, are actually the colours of the suffragette movement. Or actually, they're almost the colours of the suffragette movement. Uh, the green is there. Uh, the purple, heliotrope, is there, but actually the students removed the white, which stood for purity, and put gold in for enlightenment instead. Now, philanthropic money ran out in the city, uh, as you can probably guess, the First World War, Liverpool suffered, um, and also the Depression in the, in the 1920s. And as a consequence of that, actually, it was taken into local authority control in the days of the County Palatine, and it, the County Palatine then built this brand new campus in 1933, out here in Ormskirk, and we've been in Ormskirk ever since. Uh, we start to allow men across the threshold in 1959. Um, I think, you know, if I understand you know, what I'm told by others, plenty climbed over and into the building before then, but uh, they're only here there officially from, from 1959. And the university has just grown and expanded you know, over that time. I guess for us, culminating in the success of being identified as the Times Higher University of the Year last year. Now, through that time, actually, the you know, English has always actually been, it's one of the founding disciplines of the university. You know, and you know, we have had, therefore, English graduates going in to teach English you know, right the way back you know, in, I think, 1892, the very first ones. And actually, if you go back to 1892, there are only two places in England in which women could get an honours degree you know, to train to teach. And those two places were actually Edge Hill and Cambridge. The only difference was that it was not until 1948 that a woman could actually graduate formally from Cambridge. They could do the same exams, but they weren't allowed to formally graduate. And so um, Edge Hill was a pioneer. You know, there's links to the suffragette movement, there's links to the trade union. You know, um, Edge Hill women, Edge Hill English graduates actually working with, in the dock workers' strike in, in 1910, educating the, you know, the dock workers, so that input there. And actually the first Labour Chancellor, Philip Snowden, um, whose biography I've read on two or three occasions, his first partner you know, was an Edge Hill graduate, a woman called Ethel Anakin. And actually, if you do read his biography, it's very clear, actually, who was actually running uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's uh, responsibilities in the 1920s, and it wasn't Philip Snowden. So, it's, uh, um, so the background is interesting. More recently, of course, I mean, as I say, the university... English was one of the founding degrees of the university when it moved out of teacher training as well. 1973, we had our first English you know, degree programmes, uh, one of just four subjects offered in the university outside education and health. And, of course, that has now you know, grown and expanded. I mean, clearly we have you know, our creative writing programmes, we have specialist programmes in language as well as in literature. Um, and you know, it's one of uh, the areas in which I think we're most proud, uh, particularly in terms of research record as well, the, the work of English staff around the Short Story Prize, for example, which has been won by a whole range of you know, eminent your authors over the last, and this is the the tenth year of that prize, and it's actually double in terms of its value, you know, this year. Um, and we've had as a pleasure, you know, one of the joys of that. I mean, for example, um, you know, Caris Bray's you know, recent book, you know, which was shortlisted for you know, one of the major sort of national awards. And Caris, you know, you know, herself actually did her doctorate here, having been an Open University student, you know, prior to coming and join us. So there's a long history to the university, but also actually, you know, the discipline of English. You know, of literature, of poetry, and so on, actually has sat with the university throughout all of those 130 years. And so, staying on the subject of English, you've now launched your own publishing house? We have indeed, yes. I mean, so I, I'm really excited by this. I mean, I, you know, we had, you know, the idea actually came from colleagues in the department, um, came to us and said, look, this is of interest to us. Would we be prepared to support it? The answer to that is very, very much so. And I'll explain why. From my perspective, um, if someone comes to university, then they're giving you three years of their lives. Now, the most important single thing we do is how to give them an academic education. But I'm actually very interested in the way in which you actually help to support the person to develop you know, in, in, you know, as a complete entity. So we, work, we do provide very high-quality sports facilities, for example. We do encourage students to volunteer. We run two theatres, we run our own cinema. And actually providing those range of opportunities which I think help people to develop academically, but also actually give them industry-relevant skills is incredibly important. 
A couple of examples of that. Um, you might know, actually, that about three or four years ago, the university set up its own record label. And we've been working with Past Street Studios, where Coldplay, I think, recorded their, their first two albums. And I think we've now recorded six singles. We've actually had, you know, lay, um, we've had, we had um, you know, one of the bands was signed to Heavenly Records, for example. Another band, actually, Orangi Sun, were actually in the recording studio this week, actually working with uh, one of the big sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, recording companies. And so, you know, that activity taking place in, 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 you know, in that location is, is one example. And I think, actually, the idea from the English department was, well, you know, we're running a music label, we're running a short story prize, why don't we actually also give students the industry experience of being involved in actually setting up and running a press? You know? And actually we had that discussion you know, with, with, with Freight Books, who are a very well-known sort of independent publisher based out of Glasgow. They're working closely with us. Uh, what we're going to do, I think, the, the first book which will come out of this will come out this summer, and it'll be an anthology which is based upon uh, shortlisted and, and winning you know, entries for the short story prize. You know, the names of the authors associated that, with that will mean, I think, the press starts with a real bang. You know, and, uh, and also then the university has a tremendous record for poetry. And I think after that, we're possibly looking at an anthology of you know, modern and contemporary poetry. And we will be looking to publish something, you know, at least one or two publications each year. From the university's perspective, we're putting a five-figure sum into that. But just think of the experience the students get. You know, of actually working with prominent authors, of editing, of actually looking at how you put a book together or a collection together. You're looking at how you market it. You know, actually working with you know, you know, freight books to actually see perhaps where you procure you know, the, you know, the, the production of that, the, the setting, the printing and so on of that book. And we think it offers a tremendous opportunity for young people. Now the field of education generally, politicians, and we see the parties and the governments <laughs> come and go, and they can never leave education alone. Um, you know, if, if I was Secretary of State for Business or Secretary of State for Education or any of the departments that are tangentially even involved with education, what would your advice be? Oh, my, my, it'd almost be a plea, actually, for the most part, would be leave us alone a lot of the time. But it's, uh, I mean, one of the problems you've got with policies and politicians is, uh, well, the first thing, I mean, you, you said something there which I would agree with, that actually um, politicians come and go. And one of the things I have to do is actually not necessary to knee-jerk react to what a politician is doing this week or next week and so on. Um, they are, tend to be there. The average Secretary of State does just over two years. The average government, well, it's five years to an election. Uh, we might not get the change I might like from the immediately, but you are working in sort of five-year cycles in, t you know, in terms of government. And part of our job is actually to take a longer-term view actually to say, we can be here, we will be here. Our job is actually to have a view on what makes this university successful in 15, 20, 25, 30 years, and to work on those timescales, not necessarily to work on the politicians' you know, time, you know, timescales. Um, my take on politicians is that, uh, on policy, uh, I think it lurches like the pub drunk. You know, it's going down the alleyway and it walks into one wall and walks into the other wall. So, you know, constantly it must be, at one moment it's research is a priority, the next moment it's learning and teaching is the priority. Um, in teacher training, for example, um, you know, one moment it's, it must be in schools, the next moment it must be in universities. The truth of this, of course, is actually that the answer sits down the middle, doesn't it, you know, for a university, that actually you've got to balance the whole set of priorities and not lurch in the way. Because what happens to the pub drunk, of course, they do make their way down the alleyway, but actually they bruise themselves, they make very slow progress, and I think actually being able to steer a balanced course and taking that sort of 15, 20 year view is absolutely vital. And that's reflected, of course, in the capital investments on the campus. I mean, a time lapse for the last 10 years would, would be eye-watering to see all the buildings going up. Yes, we've we spent an eye-watering sum of money. I mean, I think we've spent um, over a quarter of a billion pounds on the campus, but there's a real reason for that. Universities aren't here to make profits. Universities are here, actually, to create a better and better experience, it seems to me. The way in which you do that is, yes, we do generate surpluses, but immediately those surpluses are poured straight back in you know, to the student experience, put them into better facilities, put them into additional you know, teaching staff, put them into better equipment, and so on. I mean, there's no point, for example, a student actually working in your area actually not being able to work you know, with the very best and the newest technology. We want to make them employable to be attractive you know, to your industry and to other industries. And to do that, you've got to invest. You've got to invest in the staff. You've got to invest in the facilities. And one of the consequences of that is that although you know, Edgehill is not perfect and there's still a distance to travel, 
it's a university which actually is very, very definitely moving in the right direction. John, thank you. It's a pleasure, no problem.